The following podcast is for informational purposes only. The contents of this podcast do not constitute tax, legal, or investment advice. Take responsibility for your own decisions, consult with the proper professionals, and do your own research. Maybe another reason why I see like Bitcoin growing quite fast or Bitcoin DeFi is that a lot of the experiments have already run in a way on different networks, right? So Ethereum mm -hmm. said that as well on some of the podcasting. Ethereum has been a test net for Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Great test net. Right. Welcome to the GRTIQ podcast. Today I'm speaking with Jorn Develter, Chief Operating Officer at Persistence Labs. Jorn's journey into Web3 spans traditional finance, consulting, and an entrepreneurial leap into the world of crypto and blockchain. Originally from Belgium, Joran built a global career that took him from working with major banks in Paris to founding a startup in Singapore. His diverse background provides a unique perspective on the emerging Bitcoin DeFi ecosystem, a narrative that seems to grow more and more every day. At Persistence Labs, Joran is working on pioneering solutions aimed at expanding the utility of Bitcoin through interoperable Layer 2 networks and innovative DeFi applications. During our conversation, Joran shares his insights into the vision for a productive Bitcoin economy, the challenges of scaling Bitcoin's infrastructure, and why he believes Bitcoin DeFi could outpace Ethereum's DeFi ecosystem. I started the conversation with Joran by discussing his upbringing in Belgium and the early influences that shaped his interest in finance and technology. First of all, thank you so much for having me. Very glad to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm from Belgium originally. I basically grew up there in a little town called Ostend. It's like a beach town, beach city, I must say. It's one of the bigger cities in Belgium. Yeah, I think Belgium is a nice place, but it's pretty small. So after I actually graduated in Belgium, I studied actually in the, the University of Leuven, studied business engineering, actually tried to go and explore the world a little bit. So I, I chose a career that kind of matched into that desire to explore the world. And I, I started working in uh, traditional finance consulting. Yeah, I went to, went to Paris for a bit. I actually did my exchange when I was studying in, in Hong Kong. And so, yeah, I worked in Paris for a bit and then moved away to Singapore for, uh, for multiple years. After six years in Singapore, I actually moved to Portugal for the last three years now. Yeah, looking actually at moving back to, to Singapore at the end of the year and, uh, go and go and explore a bit more actually on that side of the world. So, yeah, I've been uh, kind of quite global, I would say. But today, dialing in from Portugal. So I've had the opportunity to interview a lot of people on this podcast, and there's a lot of various and diverse backgrounds of people that enter and start working in Web3. One thing that makes you unique, as I think about all the other guests, is you're a retired boxer. What can you tell us about your boxing career and how long you did that? I, I am indeed a retired boxer. I am uh, one and know. I just want to state that for the record. I did one fight and I thought I was enough. Oh, yeah, I'll give you the full story. So I was back in the days in Singapore. There was this thing uh, called white collar boxing. I think it's still quite a popular thing uh, ac across the world, actually, where people in white collar jobs participate in, uh, in a boxing and a training camp for multiple weeks. It was uh, three months or three and a half months, basically. Very intense training, people who've never done boxing before. The main objective there was, was a charity event. So at the end of the, of the three month period kind of ends with a charity boxing event in which there were multiple fights. And I was one of these bouts and trained very hard for more than three months to uh, become a boxer and did one fight, one, and then decided that I didn't want to step into the ring anymore. I actually liked the training part of the boxing. I think it's nice to really be challenged and like be, be forced to really adapt, like uh, really train hard, get to spar even with people, get hit in the face, taking all these things, like putting yourself in uncomfortable situations. And it was actually a great journey, honestly. It was, it was really fun uh, and it was great for charity. I think we raised $150,000 or so for a children's hospital in Cambodia. It was a beautiful yeah, couple of months journey, but no more boxing for me on, on that level. Amazing. Well, you're fully undefeated and you might be the only undefeated boxer I ever meet. That's a great, great insight there. You mentioned as you 
graduated from university, you went to work in traditional finance and consulting. You worked at some large banks, worked with some large firms like Accenture. What did these early experiences in consulting and trad fight, how did that shape, I guess, your thinking about your career and what you wanted to do with your life? I think it was a great starting point. You know, like I think there's, I mean, when you come from educational background and you go kind of dive into the world, there's, there's a lot of people that like say, yeah, I want to work in a startup and they know from the beginning. For me, it was like, actually, I want to start in, in a corporate and kind of see how things go in the corporate world and uh, learn from that. I think for me, it was mainly like learning in a way because I know like once you start your entrepreneurial journey, it is going to be a more expensive learning curve, I think. So it's actually good to go and learn within these corporates, which is a bit more of a safe environment, I would say, to learn. I've always been kind of entrepreneurial to begin with. Like, I mean, even when I, when I was a kid, like, I mean, there was two tech things in my life, like actually three, I think sports was one. And then it was like a tech and then some sort of entrepreneurship and trying to combine those. But I mean, I'll give you an example. Like I was always first one to figure out how to clone games on the Wii and then sell those on the playground and things like that, you know? So I wonder if it was Wii or DVDs or stuff like that. So that bit of entrepreneurial spirit was was within me, but I still thought it was best to start off a career in like the more traditional way and then learn in the bigger corporate. So I started as a consultant for Accenture, uh, which was kind of combining the tech aspect and the business aspect of, of what I studied. A good learning curve, but it was maybe a little bit too corporate. It was a huge company, right? I think when I joined, I was employee number 200,000 or something, which was not really that that fun. I mean, it's still fun, but I think too big for me to to be really like, felt like that engaged in a way with everyone. So I joined a smaller, like more boutique type of consulting firm, CEO Partners, which actually I thought was was a great experience. It was great fun to work with a slightly smaller team at that, at that time. I think I was employee, maybe three or 400 or so globally, but within Belgium, I was a very, I think there was only like 15, 20 people. But then I didn't work in Belgium for very long with them. I actually were, went to Paris, uh, joined the, the bigger team there and worked for pretty much all of the, like the bigger banks that were around at that stage. Yeah, that was, a, I mean, great experience, I think, because you really know how, like, you, you get to know how banks operate, how big they are. They're, they're a bit slow, which is, I think, a good insight to have. It, it is true compared to what we do now. Through that, I've always been kind of between the tech and the business side of things. So I have a very deep understanding of the, the financial side of things, but I have that deep and keen interest on the tech side. So I've always kind of played that role to kind of connect the business and the tech side and then and, and kind of play that, yeah, like, how do you say project management, product management type of role to figure out what's the best way to kind of develop products going forward. So I did that in, in Paris for more than two years and then kind of decided that it was time to go back to Asia, uh, where I spent uh, quite a bit of time for my exchange back in the days. So I moved to our Singapore office of the same consulting firm, uh, worked for a bunch more banks, always a little bit slow. And I think the main thing that, that, that was for me, the, the point of kind of wanting to change to something else was the, the lack of kind of entrepreneurship and like true like get through a daily activity in a way that was like really exciting. It's more of like a day-to-day, every day is the same type of thing. Yeah, I wanted to do something more entrepreneurial again, you know? So I joined a, another startup, uh, which was just literally founded and it's in, in fashion tech. So you probably haven't heard that too much either. Basically joined a startup as like the, the third guy within the team of two co-founders that focused on fashion tech. So basically what does that mean? We were bringing tech more to a fashion industry. When I say fashion, it's, it's about suits that are made to measure for, for men. So it's suits and shirts, basically custom-made clothing, made accessible through tech. Did that for six years, actually, uh, in Singapore. We were actually nominated as one of the top 100 or top 300 fastest growing companies in Asia and, and in Singapore for two times in a row. So that was, was quite fun. But then when, when COVID hit, I mean, we were selling suits, which typically is for weddings or for, for uh, business attire. During COVID, there was not that much demand for, for the product because no one was getting married. No one was going to the office. So it was a bit at a slow point then. I mean, business still around and then still, still exists. But for me, like, that's when I lost a bit of interest because it was kind of slowing down. And I always need something that's really fast-paced and exciting. And uh, that's when I started to look back at crypto. I looked at it a bit earlier as well. But that's really when, when COVID hit, I really thought this is a time to really pick up the pace on the crypto side and really dive in heads first now, now that I have a bit of time on my hands uh, because business is slow anyway. 
so yeah, that's how I got into crypto. I'm not sure if even that, that was the question, but I kind of got to it. Yeah, it's great. What were your first impressions of crypto? You mentioned that it was sort of COVID when you returned to it, but you had come across it before. What were those early experiences like and what was your perception given the fact that you were working in TradFi and working in consulting? So my very first interaction with crypto was actually very early. You know, it was like 2009, I believe. Bitcoin literally just launched and I I realized that you could actually mine it like on your laptop, right? Like the, the Bitcoin mining, which I figured out. But back in the day, I had no clue what it was. I just learned about it and I, I saw like, okay, this is cool. You can do this and you can earn like some free tokens, whatever, by doing this on your on your laptop or on your own like computer. But I never really understood the concept behind it. So that for me, it was just part of something where you have to try it, but then kind of left it behind for what it was. Never came back to it until like 2017, right? So really left it out. like never even realized about everything that I kind of left behind. So in 2017, I think that, I mean, crypto started to pick up again a bit, bit more mainstream. And I just kind of looked at it more from an investor angle, you know, like I was very busy at the time with the business, the, the fashion tech business, but a little bit of, of like investing on the personal side um, here and there, which I think was for me more than enough to, to be in crypto at that time, because I wanted to build out the other business that I, that I started in, right? But then, yes, yeah, as, as I said, like when things kind of started to to be slow and, and, and in COVID kind of thought it was time to take a next step and go even further into crypto, which was quite exciting. I mean, it's, it's exciting, but on like on the investment side, didn't make money at that time. I obviously made money, but then lost it all. I think that's typical for people's first cycle. Like you have to lose it all to, to have the right to do a second cycle, right? Yeah, that's, that's kind of how I got involved in crypto. And then yeah, 2021 20, really like started to look for a job actually. The GRTIQ podcast is made possible by a generous grant from the Graph Foundation. The Graph Grants program provides support for protocol infrastructure, pooling, gaps, subgraphs, and community building efforts. Learn more at the Graph.Foundation. That's the Graph.Foundation. Hi, this is GRTIQ, and thank you for listening. Listeners who enjoy this content can help support the GRTIQ podcast by leaving a review or a five-star rating wherever they download podcasts, by sharing episodes on social media, or by simply telling a friend or colleague about something they heard or learned from one of our guests. It's support from listeners like you that make it possible for us to keep shining a light on the people and stories behind Web3 and The Graph. Let's talk a little bit more about that. So how would you explain that path you took then to finding opportunities to go full-time and working in crypto and Web3? I mean, uh, I think it was first of all, like trying to figure out what do I want to do within this industry? Like it's a big industry. It's like coming up and um, it's not like everyone has a job there or everyone knows how to introduce you to the right people and stuff, right? So for me, it was a lot about learning. I did a lot of like learning, self-study, try, trying things out and really kind of go around the different ecosystems that there are, figuring out like what's most interesting for me at that time, where can I actually make a difference, like what would fit well with within my my experience as well, right? So I looked around in, in like various things. Eventually, kind of was very interested in Ethereum. I think the, the path they had to like proof of stake, I think that was very interesting. With that also came across Cosmos, so the Cosmos ecosystem. And for some way, I don't know whether it's like, and a serendipity in a way, kind of reconnected with an old colleague of mine from from Sia Partners, who, when I left Sia Partners, he left shortly after that, and he actually went into the the crypto industry, uh, started hit his podcast actually back in the day, and then joined like a crypto venture fund arm, and reconnected with him uh, in a way, and then kind of he was the founder of Persistence. So one thing kind of led to another, like he realized that actually was very keen and eager to to join the industry. I had a couple of ideas on things to work on. And yeah, it got me to to join his company. Yeah, we've been working alongside like ever since. It's been, been a great journey. How would you explain to somebody who's listening to this interview, or maybe it's like a friend or family member, and in fact, maybe you had to do this at some point in your life, but how would you explain someone with 
your education, your experience in TradFi, you're working in consulting, you're working at notable firms. Why would someone like you leave all that sort of security or credibility of, of that industry and that work to work in something that seems so new, a nascent industry like crypto? What's the explanation? I think it's the like the urge to do something new and exciting and kind of bleeding edge when it comes to to tech. Sure, security is nice, but to me, that's not really like entrepreneurship, right? And uh, entrepreneurship is is often about like finding new ways and new things, and that's to me what excites me. You know, I often say this: if things are too comfortable, it means you're not moving fast enough. That's really how I felt at that point. Like, look, this tradfi thing, like, sure, it's comfortable, but it's to me, it's not moving fast enough. So I like the speed and then the the fast paced environment that that the industry brings, and it's something new. Like it's if you would ask people back in the days, it's like, yeah, would you want to be part of the dot com boom in a way, or do you want to do you want to launch an internet company? A lot of people would have said, no, that doesn't excite me. That does like, if I was there back at the day, I would have probably also said, oh, that's super interesting, right? I just like the unknown in a way when it comes to business, uh, figuring things out, and that attracted me. And and I think with that, the enormous potential of what we're doing here in this industry when it comes to kind of breaking with the the things that we know from traditional finance, traditional banking, making things more open, more uh, more decentralized, more transparent in a way. I think those are all kind of values that I believe in quite well. And yeah, it resonates with me. And I think it would be nice to be and play a big role in that in that future of finance. Look, I still think the future of Bitcoin is is enormous and potentially like the Bitcoin economy will be the biggest economy in the world one day. And it would be nice to to have a, a say in that, or not even a say, but just like uh, some some sort of kind of contribution to that, right? And I still believe that that's like very much a plausible outcome where Bitcoin is kind of the basis for for everything that is kind of like an economy. Well, as you mentioned, you joined Persistence Labs in 2021, and you work there presently as Chief Operating Officer. For listeners that aren't familiar with Persistence, what it is, what it does. Can you just share a little insight, top level introduction? I mean, I'll try to explain like very simple, right? Like so, Bitcoin is a is a network, is a crypto cryptocurrency network that is uh, quite famous uh, for doing transactions, but it's also famous for being quite slow and expensive to transact on. So people are trying to bring scalability and like programmability to Bitcoin. So similar to what they've done on the Ethereum side, like really bringing smart contracts to the network. That's now happening on Bitcoin. So people are expanding the possibilities on Bitcoin. And with that, a lot of Bitcoin, what, what's so-called like layer twos are created. So there's different blockchains that are created to solve the problem of being slow and being hard to, to do anything on. So now what we solve is like, that's obviously great. That's solving a problem of scalability. Now that that solving of that problem of scalability actually creates new issues. It's, it creates a fragmentation issue is what we see. So there's pockets of different networks, different blockchains that are now building on top of Bitcoin, which is great. But each of these little economies on top of Bitcoin, they're not really connected to each other. And that's actually what we do. We actually connect these little networks or blockchains, which are natively not really talking to each other because each blockchain doesn't really, it lives in its own. It doesn't really talk to any other blockchains, not natively without specific uh, infrastructure. So we kind of come in and we provide a bridge between these networks to transfer BTC or Bitcoin from one network to another. So that's, I think, as simple as I can explain it. It's kind of bridging Bitcoin between different networks that are built on top of Bitcoin. I've had a bunch of guests on the podcast that are working in that L2 space in Bitcoin and a couple other sort of service providers that are focused on the Bitcoin ecosystem. I want to ask you this question that I've asked them, which is sort of this re-emergence of Bitcoin from the perspective of programmability. We had the ordinal thing that sort of sprung up. That all happened, I think, at the front of this cycle, if we're even in a cycle. Where did that come from? Like you were sort of front row to that. How would you explain that re-emergence and interest in Bitcoin as something that people could build on or program? Yeah, I think the the main reason is is actually the the Taproot upgrade. I think which which happened in was it twenty twenty one? I don't remember exactly, but basically the Taproot upgrade allowed Bitcoin 
to be a little bit more efficient in the way it, like it, it handles transactions, it handles data in a way. And with that, with that like out of Taproot, even after Taproot, the upgrade, it still took, I think, two years for like ordinals and, and runes to be created last year, right? With 2023. So yeah, I think 2021 was Taproot. I mean, I see it as small. It's obviously big. There's a lot of uh, debate that went into, into that Taproot upgrade. For sure, it was a way to for, for the Bitcoin ecosystem to somewhat address the the things that they saw on the Ethereum side, right? Where Ethereum was really gaining a lot of steam, a lot of adoption when it comes to programmability, DeFi, and all of these things. So Taproot was a little bit of an answer, I think, to that. But yeah, then you have so Ordinals and, and Runes kind of was the first layer of innovation that that was kind of showing that Bitcoin has further options than just being like a store of a store of value or just 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 digital gold, right? Now with with ordinals and runes, you can actually have NFTs and you have actually different types of tokens that can be traded on Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, the network is more than just a store of value. So that's kind of the origin, but I think it's even now like been taken further by a few other innovations. So I think ZK Tech. So zero knowledge proofs, I think, are becoming more and more adopted in a way. I think it's quite a quite an important piece of the of the puzzle for networks that are trying to put a whole bunch of data, like very very condensed, into these Bitcoin blocks because Bitcoin blocks are very small. You can't put a lot of them in, like a lot of data in it. And also, there's only one block every let's say ten minutes or so. So you have to be very very limited in terms of like the the data that you put on. But still, once you put it on there, like you want to be able to verify all of the transactions you've kind of compiled into that block, uh, all the history behind it. So ZK Tech definitely helps there to make it like more scalable. And so with that, I think there's one other like part there is like the, the search for yield in a way for Bitcoin has truly begun now with, um, there's a few protocols that are looking into Bitcoin staking. I think Babylon is a very famous one. I think their TVL now is is like 1.5 billion or so, but they've they've capped it actually at the moment for their launch. But so what it does is basically allows you to lock up your Bitcoin, so that you can use it as a form of security to secure other protocols or chains, who then can create some form of like a a yield on your Bitcoin because they have to pay for the security. So I think a combination of these factors, right? Like so, you have the zk tag, you have um, this Taproot upgrade, which enables a few more things. You have actually, there's BitVM. It's a tech that, that is quite nascent as well, uh, allows for some sort of smart contract development on top of Bitcoin. Then you have all these layer twos that are now able to leverage the security from, from Bitcoin. Kind of it all comes together in, in this cycle. It's really like 2020 or this year, actually, that it's like really been sp- like sparking up. And I expect to like see a, 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 bigger, a bigger push actually next year. A lot of these L2s are still very early days. Uh, some of them still have to go live. Yeah, I've been very excited to see what, what's coming. I had the opportunity to interview Charlie Hu for episode 175. He's one of the co-founders over at BitLayer, and we talked a lot about BitVM. So a lot of time listeners of the podcast are already familiar with some of those concepts. You mentioned earlier that you had early insider vision for sort of the impact that Bitcoin could have in the world, and you, you continue to sort of have conviction for that. And I'm just wondering, how does something like Bitcoin DeFi and the emergence of L2s and all the things that you're working on at Persistence, how does that sort of inform this vision you have for what Bitcoin could become? Because I think you know, early on, it was just a store of value, and that was sort of the perception, this strange store of value internet money. But your vision seems to be much more expansive. Talk to us about that. If you look at Bitcoin, the asset, right? Like it's now one of the top 10 assets in the world. I think in terms of size, it's the 10th biggest asset in the world, but it's not productive. Right? Like it's an asset, like people see it as a store of value, similar to gold and silver, who are both in the top 10 as well, but they are still not productive and nor they don't really have any capabilities of becoming a real productive asset. Sure, you can. You can probably like get some yield on, on gold or silver if you use it as collateral and you use some some other like options, maybe, I don't know, on, on gold. Probably make it somewhat usable or productive. But so with Bitcoin, it is a digital currency. It's top 10 in the world now. And we haven't even started at exploring like what if we build a real Bitcoin economy around this. If you look at the other assets in the top 10, most of these are companies, right? These companies have products, but like so many different products, they have real world value. 
they have an economy around it, like so many uh, employees creates employment, it creates dividends for shareholders, right? Like there's an entire economy going around these assets. These are all like productive assets. In it. And Bitcoin is not yet that, right? And it's already in the top 10. So for me, it's like, how can we make this asset, which is already top 10, how can we actually make it more productive, which typically means how can we, how can we generate yield on that, right? Like if you hold Bitcoin now, how can you kind of hold more Bitcoin in the future? Or how can you make that like a source of wealth in a way where if you hold it, you earn something, uh, right? And to me, that entire DeFi narrative or the entire DeFi ecosystem is a way to actually make that productive. I and mean, that's why I'm so bullish on it, because we know DeFi works, like we've seen it on Ethereum, like there is interest. There are a lot of people using DeFi products every day. Yeah, I think it's still early days, but eventually a lot of the current like world infrastructure, even when it comes to like like money and finance, could actually run on, on crypto rails, I would say, because the traditional banking system, sure it works, but it's not that efficient. It's not that transparent. It's not that open for anyone to to join, right? It's, it's quite limited, like you have to have a bank account. So there's a whole lot of problems with the, the traditional finance system. And I do think like with, with DeFi, you solve those. And I think with the asset that Bitcoin is, the, the size, the, the mind share, I think it's yeah, huge potential there. You said in another interview that you actually think Bitcoin DeFi could be a lot bigger than DeFi on Ethereum, just because alone, the Bitcoin size of market is much bigger. I'm just curious, though, if there's other reasons that we might sort of think that that might be true. So if we subtract out the fact that the total available market for Bitcoin might be much larger than something like Ethereum, are there other reasons why Bitcoin DeFi might be able to outpace and replace sort of that Ethereum DeFi ecosystem? I think the main reason for me is mindshare. Like, look, if I say anyone who is not in the industry, I say like, look, I'm, I'm in crypto. Oh, crypto is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is crypto. And people don't really look further than that. So I think mindshare is the number one reason that it could work, I think. Maybe another reason why I see like Bitcoin growing quite fast or Bitcoin DeFi is that a lot of the experiments have already run in a way on different networks, right? So Ethereum said that as well on some of the podcasting. Ethereum has been a testnet for Bitcoin, great testnet, but now everything can actually be adopted even faster on the Bitcoin side. I think those things probably, yeah, would help to, to really make it grow faster and, and bigger than anything we see now. But yeah, I think it comes to like mindshare adoption, overall acceptance as well. It seems like also with the ETFs and stuff, right? Like you see Bitcoin is accepted as, as an asset now. ETH, share a little bit as well. Like there's also ETH ETFs, but all, their, like all the other assets, not yet, right? So yeah, I think it's just miles ahead and I'm not sure if it will be like losing that dominance. You know, Bitcoin dominance is I think 60% or so. That means that 60% of all crypto assets is actually Bitcoin, which leaves 40% to the rest. And I actually do believe that if eventually Bitcoin dominance will probably continue to go up for even longer as Bitcoin now allows for programmability and scalability as well. It was always like Bitcoin has, has never focused on programmability and scalability in a way that, that was very clear. It was all about distribution, adoption, more going mainstream, right? Ethereum was very clear. It was all about, they focused on programmability not even really on scalability because it's even Ethereum as it, as it was back in the day, not really scalable. Now with all these L2s, it is. So now I think Bitcoin took a more decentralized approach from the get-go and a more focus on distribution and really community adoption and stuff. And now they focus on, yeah, on, on that programmability. I think that's the right order of things in a way. You and the team at Persistence have been working on some pioneering solutions related to Intense-based architecture. Intense have come up on this podcast a couple times over the years, and when it does, there's high conviction for how important something like Intense are for unlocking like more value, more adoption, better transactions through DeFi. I'm not sure I fully understand Intense quite yet. What can you tell us about what you're building there and why it's so important? Yeah, sure. I mean, Intense, I think. Uh, obviously, I mean, people don't really know what it really means. It's a simple word, though, intense, but it's not always clear what it, what it means. But to me, intense is just, it's a way of being able to express what exactly you want and then getting that done in the way that you don't really care how it gets done. So 
I'll give an example that I, I, I've used to explain it to people who are also not familiar, right? So let's say if you order something on Uber Eats, I'm sure you're familiar with Uber Eats, you order something, let's say you want to have a spaghetti and you're hungry now and you're, you're okay to, to get that spaghetti from that particular restaurant in, let's say, maximum 30 minutes, right? So that is your expected result. That is your intent. I want the spaghetti in 30 minutes delivered at this address and it needs to come from this restaurant, right? So this is your intent. Now, how Uber finds this driver to pick up that spaghetti? How this guy makes the spaghetti? Like, obviously, like you hope it's correct and according to the recipe, but how, like, how Uber gets someone to pick it up? Which route he takes on his motorcycle and on his car? Whether he uses a motorcycle or a car, you don't care, right? As long as it gets delivered within your like expected time frame, you'll be happy. And that's kind of what it intends to. Currently in crypto, it doesn't really work like that because of the way blockchains work and you have like a very limited, yeah, always limited block and then like blocks don't really communicate. So everything needs to be finished within a block. It's quite hard to achieve that, especially when you start trying to look at things between different blockchains. So especially when it comes to like bridging, like you want to go from one asset on one chain to another asset on another chain, you would have to kind of define the entire process of how exactly do I bridge that token from this chain to the other. There might be a few steps in between, but you as a user, you should actually not care about that. Like what we want to do is like, we want to abstract away the complexity from the user. And you just want the user to, to tell us, look, I want to trade token A on chain A for token B on chain B. And that's like what I want. This is my intent. You'll obviously, you'll see some quotes and you'll accept the best quote typically for, for getting that fulfilled. But how it happens in the background, you don't care. And that's kind of what intents are. And for us, it's a huge unlock when it comes to user like experience. It's like a UX play of sorts where, and you can even do multiple steps, right? Like even if you say, look, I want to trade from this token to that token. And then after that, I want to deposit this token into that protocol to do this action. All of that, you can actually, it's a simple, you can package that in one intent. You say, look, this is what I want to do. And someone else can actually even deposit it on your behalf in that protocol, right? So that you can really, really just focus on the core thing, which is building the front end, which is very simple for user that allows them to submit what exactly they want. That's, that's really what intent is about. You mentioned that these are sort of early days for Bitcoin, DeFi, and as I mentioned earlier, I've had some guests on the podcast before that have talked a little bit about this. There's been this remarkable emergence of activity, interest in Bitcoin outside of just this store of value thesis. Can you just give a little more insight on sort of where we are now, the types of Bitcoin, DeFi that exist, the things that people can do, and then what you sort of think happens next? What's the big sort of next milestone in this context that people should sort of watch for? Yeah, I mean, it's still quite limited at this moment. I think what you can do, when I talk about BTC, FI, actually when, how I kind of describe the term, it's, it's Bitcoin powered decentralized finance. So for me, it's actually quite wide. Maybe it's a wider definition than what many people have when they say BTC, FI, sometimes they think it needs to be DeFi on top of Bitcoin. So that's slightly like a different definition, but for me, it's a bit wider. So if you use Bitcoin, the asset in any DeFi protocol, to me, I call that like BTC Fi. Currently, we've seen actually some of that on Ethereum, right? So there is wrapped BTC or WBTC as the, as the bridged version or the wrapped version of Bitcoin on Ethereum. It's used in DeFi, but it's quite limited. You know, it's less than 1% of the Bitcoin supply that is used on Ethereum. There's a few other chains that have similar things. Right now you have on base, you have Coinbase BTC, which is starting to get used in DeFi. You have BTC beyond Binance, right? To me, those are also like part of the, the BTC Fi and ecosystem. But I think where the real like unlock comes from now is to actually, instead of bringing these different assets to places where the tech was actually enabling DeFi, so like these different chains like Ethereum, Base, uh, maybe other chains as well, now bringing the tech to the asset itself, because that's still where I think most people care about, about Bitcoin. It's the security that comes with, with Bitcoin. And Ethereum or acting with your rabbit BTC on Ethereum does not have the same security guarantees as acting on a true Bitcoin layer two 
uh, with your actually like different form of Bitcoin there. So I think that's a big unlock. So kind of bringing the tech from like bringing the tech to the asset. I think that's one. Another big unlock, in my opinion, is is what so what Babylon is doing, what other protocols are doing is this Bitcoin staking is making Bitcoin yield bearing in a way. There's currently a few ways of kind of yeah making money of your Bitcoin. Like one is as similar like as what I mentioned with gold. Like you can lend it out, you can use that collateral, right? But now, like if you can stake it as well, it's another like vertical of sorts to to make your Bitcoin yield generating. Um, I think that's another unlock. Yeah, I think like the combination of these things is just what is kind of the potential. And I think the the coolest thing that we'll see like will be will be around forms where you can like reuse some of that Bitcoin. So let's say you stake your Bitcoin, right? You get yield on it, you get a representative token like as collateral that you can use as collateral. You put that in a borrowing lending protocol and you can, for example, lever up a little bit, right? So you borrow more USD to buy more Bitcoin, which you can stake again. So you can do like leverage liquid staking on your Bitcoin. I know it's quite complex, but instead of having two or 3% yield maybe on your Bitcoin, you can now get like 10%. Obviously you take a slightly bigger risk because if Bitcoin price goes down significantly, you might get like cold on your, uh, on your loans. But I think it's a very interesting concept. So you can do that. Like, obviously I think just just only borrowing lending itself, I think will be a huge unlock. So there's like $1.5 trillion almost, right? It's just sitting there, but you can't really use it. You can't borrow against it. But with DeFi really coming like into, into these next stages, imagine you can now borrow USD against that and you don't have to borrow the full amount. Right? Like let's say even you borrow 20, 30%, or let's say you borrow 33%. Let's say 33% of all Bitcoin is kind of used as collateral, right? Let's say that's that's um, half uh, yeah half a trillion dollar. Let's say five hundred billion dollars, right? You use as collateral to now borrow, and then you have additional like money that can kind of flow into other things, right? Like it's it's kind of using a bit of leverage on top of Bitcoin, just make it more productive and to yeah make that asset more valuable in a way, um, if that makes sense. So I want to ask you this question that harkens back to your experience in consulting and working in TradFi, but. Let's assume, for example, that the crypto space is more centralized than it is today. And there's a way for you as a consultant to kind of come in and shape the industry, what it's going to do next, what it's going to focus on. So this is obviously just a thought experiment here. But assuming that that was the case and you were hired to come in and sort of grow this thing to get it to mass adoption, the next big unlock for greater use, greater interest. What would you focus on? What would you advise? Hey, crypto industry, the best place to start driving greater adoption is here. What would you say? <laughs> That's very, I like the question. Very original like question. I haven't heard that, that before. I mean, my, my first thought is that instead of doing more, I would actually try and do less as an industry. You know, like there's a whole bunch of stuff that the industry has kind of taken and pushed, which I think kind of conflicting a little bit with, with what we're doing and like it hurts herself, you know, like I'm talking about all these meme coins, all these scams, all these issues that you have with the industry, like no one takes it seriously just because of those things, right? So if I would have like a magic hand in a way to, to, to shape the industry, I'd probably do away with a little bit of that. I think you need some for the culture. Like I think memes and NFTs and stuff are a good part of the, of the culture and for people to kind of feel part of, of the group. But I think it maybe has kind of gone a little bit too too far and like, especially like all these meme coins and all these scams. And I think it's a bit too much for for the, the reputation of our industry. I think that's one, so doing less on, on that front. And when it comes to like doing more or focusing on, on one thing, I would say it's uh, education. You know, I think education towards the, I think the masses is maybe maybe a big word, but I think people still don't really know what it's all about until they really come into trouble. You know, like I was recently, I was, I was traveling, uh, I was sitting in a restaurant and, and some people next to me started talking about like how their banks, their banks kind of locked up their funds because like they were moving and like one of the document like was, was not signed or whatever it was like. And he was like talking, I get $10,000 was frozen in the bank. And like, we started interacting at some point. I can't remember exactly how it happened, but started explaining about like Bitcoin and the free, like no one has access to your, your money. Like, 
if the bank tomorrow decides to like say that you're not a customer or you've never been a customer, what are you going to do? Right? Like if the government tomorrow says, well, you're, you're actually, you have no right to have a bank account with this bank, what are you going to do? But with Bitcoin, at least you have some of these guarantees that look, it is, it's your, like if you have the key to this wallet, it's your keys, you keep it secure. It's your money in a way, right? And it's like those values, I think people don't think about it enough. People take it for granted that like, yeah, there's banks and these are safe and these are yeah, acting in my best interest. And sure, that could work in, in many countries, but in many countries, it's not the case, right? And uh, even like in times of like, severe distress in certain countries, you've seen it, right? Where the government says, okay, you can't withdraw your money. And I feel already like in Portugal, like here, you're allowed to withdraw like 200 euros at a time from the, from the ATM, which I think is like, it's a, it's a constraint, right? Like, and I'm sure you can do multiple ATMs or multiple transactions, but it's like, why, why put this limit? It's my money, right? If I want to withdraw more than 200, I should be able to. And these things, like, I think to me, it's a bit of like education and kind of like making people understand why a lot of us are working in this industry, I think that would be, I think, a good thing to, to kind of work on. And then, again, like going back to intents is just making things simpler uh, when it comes to UX, uh, like user experience. It is too complicated. Uh, a lot of the UX is very basic within crypto. It's just like very quick and, and like, yeah, it's not really inviting for users to come aboard, right? It's not easy as well, like all these different wallets, all these different chains. Uh, we need to abstract that complexity away. Uh, we need to bring it to mobile at some point, which is also not easy because it kind of comes with a lot of issues on the security side as well. But yeah, those would be probably my things, you know, it's like education and uh, yeah, making it more user-friendly and uh, using intents to do that probably. You've sort of alluded to this, but I want to ask this question formally, which is having spent so much of your time as a consultant working deeply in TradFi and the banking industry, obviously that's an industry that's primed for either disruption or just greater adoption of something like Bitcoin. When you look back on those days, do you see sort of gaps in that business model of traditional banking, traditional finance, where you're like, oh boy, once Bitcoin sort of gets some traction there, it's going to totally change things? Or do you have the opinion that it's sort of already being adopted and we're seeing early seeds of sort of what that'll look like in the future? Um, yeah, slightly tricky. I think it's, I mean, the, the thing is with the banking system, like it actually works, you know, like it works kind of for most day-to-day -day activities, it works and people are not even looking for alternatives, right? Because it actually does work if you have the, the regular use cases, which are mostly covered by most of the banks and most of the, most of the countries, right? And if you live in one of those countries that is like fortunate enough to have most people banked, you'll probably, you'll probably be okay. You don't need like something else that is better, right? Even if it is maybe 10x better. I don't know if it's a 10x better at this stage, you know, and typically when it comes to disruption, we're talking like making things like 10x better, right? That's a tricky one. Like it's hard to just like, I'm sure it's better. Is it 10 times better than the current banking system? I don't know. Hard to say. I would say so, but not everyone is con like convinced about that, right? And that might have been, might take a bit of time. And then typically, it's what I say: is like people have to run into issues to to realize, oh, actually, this is not great. Um, but I think yeah, the longer time horizon, more more and more issues will come up. Well, well Jerome, now I'm going to ask you the GRT IQ 10. These are ten questions I ask each guest of the podcast every week, and it's an opportunity for us to kind of learn some new things from you. I always hope that listeners will learn something new, try something different, or achieve more in their own life. And it's always fun to get all these great answers. So are you ready for the GRT IQ 10? Let's let's do it. Let's do it. The GRT IQ 10. This is the way. 10 questions for astronauts floating in space. What book or article has had the most impact on your life? Yeah, so for me, there's actually this two. Like one is Atomic Habits by James Clear. I think I'm a very methodological person in a way. Like I just kind of like my daily habits and trying to improve on a daily basis. Like I think step by step compounding over time, I think is a great way to improve. And the other one I, I really like is Outliers by by Malcolm Gladwell. 
which I read a long time ago, probably like 10 years ago. Uh, but it's still like sometimes it comes up. And I think there is, it's more about like, sure, these like atomic habits in a way are very useful, but a lot of like success also comes from being in the right place, the right time, the right circumstances, right? So I think a combination of these two books is probably how I think about many things, actually. Is there a movie or a TV show that you think everybody should watch? My, my favorite TV show I recommend to everyone is Curb Your Enthusiasm, but um, I'm not sure if everyone will like it, but I do think it's an interesting form of humor, which I, <laughs> I really enjoy. But yeah, it could be, could be an interesting one. If you could only listen to one music album for the rest of your life, which one do you choose? So if you'll be surprised, like I actually rarely listen to music, very rarely, and I actually should listen more often. But I would probably go for something like classical music, like a top 50 best classical music hits or so, because it's something that for me works at any time. Like I used to listen to classical music when I was studying back in the days. Like even when you're working, I think it's nice. Even if we are working out, I think it still works. So for me, it's like timeless in a way, and um, classical music. And how about this one? What's the best advice someone's ever given to you? Um, <laughs> quite blunt, but it's like, you're going to die. If you keep that in mind, like every day, I think you live slightly differently, you know? Um, it kind of forces you to think like, okay, every day can be the last one. So make sure you live like life to the fullest in a way. And yeah, I think you're going to die is a very powerful kind of piece of advice. What's one thing you've learned in your life that you don't think most other people have learned or know quite yet? Um, I think for me, it's the, like the power of consistency, you know, like being able to continuously do things and like saying you'll do something and then actually do it uh, and doing that over and over again and to build reputation uh, for yourself, I think. Kind of goes back a little bit to these atomic habits as well. You know, it's like consistency, kind of compounding effect. I think that for me is something I realize a lot of people haven't figured out. Like you see people doing something once, like and say, okay, uh, now I'm, I'm done with it. It's not how it works. Yeah. And how about this one, Jaren? What's the best life hack you've discovered for yourself? It's the, like one of the laws that I come back to is like Parkinson's law. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's sign that it states that work expands to the amount of time that you kind of give it to completion, right? And I think for me, it's the life hack that this works on yourself, but also for other people you work with, right? So if there's a task that is like quite simple to execute, like don't give yourself two days treated, like put a deadline for yourself. Same for people you work with, like give strict deadlines, obviously reasonable, both for yourself and people you work with. And you'll get so much more done because otherwise you start procrastinating and everyone kind of procrastinates in a way and just takes as much time as they're given. Jaron, based on your own life experiences and observations, what's the one habit or characteristic that you think best explains how people find success in life? And like, I can only say one word and like it's, it's on the screen and uh, persistence. It's the name of the company. It resonates very well with me, actually. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, well... There's no video in this, but I have it even on, on my wall in terms of like my main values. I think just persistence, I think is very underrated. Um, I think you need persistence yeah, for finding success in life. And then the final three questions are complete the sentence type questions. So the first one is the thing that most excites me about the future of Web3 is? The potential for creating the Bitcoin economy. And how about this one? If you're on X or Twitter, whatever anyone calls it, then you should be following. Sahil Bloom. I really like, like the content he puts out. And then the final question, I'm happiest when? When I can spend time with the people I love, like family, friends, kids, wife, things like that. The GRT IQ 10. And I show you how. Jaren, what an incredible opportunity to kind of meet you, hear your story, and get some insight into all the things that are going on in the Bitcoin ecosystem, as well as BTC Fi and the future of Bitcoin DeFi. If listeners want to stay in touch with you, follow things you're working on, as well as connect with Persistence Labs and, and figure out sort of how to plug into that ecosystem, what's the best way for them to do it? The easiest way is uh, persistence.one. That's the website on which you'll find the link to all the, the socials, all the Telegram, Discord, like all the places where our community is active. 
And obviously on Twitter or X, your handle is uh, Persistence One. So yeah, there you'll you'll find everything you need to know about us and uh, how we move the needle on the Bitcoin ecosystem. This has been a production of the GRT IQ podcast. For more information, including detailed show notes, visit grtiq.com slash podcast. That's grtiq.com slash podcast. Please consider contributing to this project and helping build the community by subscribing and leaving a review. G-R-T-I-Q podcast.